Thank you. Uh, so welcome everyone. Thank you for attending our Julie McDonald webinar series on self-motivation. We at Business Station are very proud to bring you this session as part of the Australian Small Business Advisory Services Digital Solutions Program. Say that one 10 times um, and I bet you'll, you'll get your tongue twisted. Uh, so this program is funded by Oz Industry. So during this session, we will be talking to Julie about self-motivation. Julie is going to teach you, hopefully teach you how to motivate yourself and not look externally for day-to-day -day inspiration. So by introduction, Julie McDonald is an, is an Olympic and Commonwealth Games swimmer who has won medals for Australia at both of those games. Julie held the Commonwealth record for the 800 metre freestyle for 21 years and still holds one of the top six times an Australian has ever produced three years after setting her initial record. That is very impressive. <laughs> um, so just an important note for anyone attending uh, this session will be recorded and the recording will be shared with you once available. Um, so I will pass it over to Julie uh, to introduce herself and our panellists. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, lovely to see everybody here today and uh, our last session, uh, so that's exciting that I can't believe those four weeks have gone so quickly. So today we are talking about self-motivation and uh, that is a super interesting topic um, and something that uh, a lot of people sort of ask, how did I motivate myself when I was competing? So the last four weeks has been super exciting. Um, we've had four different webinars. We've had on resilience, health and well-being, effective communication and self-motivation. So if you missed any of those, um, you should be able to get recordings of those and um, go back and have a bit of a look. So let's have a look at self-motivation. You know, what is it? Uh, it's the ability to drive ourselves uh, to achieve the goals and the dreams that we've set for ourselves. It's our inner uh, drive, our core desire, and the pursuit of goals or tasks because we want to achieve them, not because we have to, which sometimes is the case. <laughs> so um, my, I guess my little journey, I shared a little bit of that um, in the first webinar with resilience, um, but I was an aspiring Olympian. I didn't know it at the time. I learned to swim when I was eight years old. Um, I competed because I loved it and I had uh, teachers at school who encouraged me to go into zone carnivals and regionals and you know had that support structure uh, behind that and the first time that I heard about the Olympics was uh, I was 10 uh, oh, yeah 10 years old and it was the upcoming um, Olympics for 1980 in Moscow and just given away my age and uh, it was you know, a lot of controversy around those Olympics. So for those of you who may not have been around then, uh, you know, there was a lot of uh, talk about boycott um, and it was very political. So there was a lot of media hype. And I remember I got interviewed by Channel 10. Um, it was called Channel 10 back then, I think. And, you know, about what do I think? You know, I was a 10 year old. And of course, I just said, I think they should go, you know, like who are politicians to stop us? <laughs> But, you know, I didn't always win. You know, there's me getting third place uh, on the little dais there, an old photo. Um, so because I didn't win, what really, why did I keep going? You know, what kept me lining up on the blocks uh, week in, week out if I wasn't winning? As I said before, I swam because I loved it and I loved competing. But then there was one moment um, that really uh, changed my life. And that was a swimmer by the name of John Sieben. Jono, as we knew him, or Pygmy, for those who really knew him, um, he got Pygmy because he was only five foot 10 and he was competing against swimmers all around the world that were mostly over six feet. And when Jono was competing in the 200 meters butterfly in LA in 1984, I was glued to my TV. He was the underdog, and he was competing against the world record holder, Mikhail Gross, who um, was six foot seven and had the nickname of the albatross because every time he took a butterfly stroke, his arms would touch the lane rope. 
I remember sitting on my couch for that race and that first 100 metres, the American Pablo Morales had taken the lead and Jono was in about sixth place. And when they touched at the third 50, Mikhail Gross was in the lead, uh, Pablo Morales had died off and Jono had moved up into fourth place. And when they came back that last 50, I could see Jono really starting to surge. And I got off the couch and I started moving closer to the TV. And as he got closer and closer to um, the wall, I could see that he, he and Gross were really fighting it out for who was winning and who was coming second. And the commentators suddenly got excited, you know, because they could see that Jono was uh, a medal chance. And then, well, Jono hit that wall and he won the Olympic gold medal. He'd broken the world record um, and he was the Olympic champion. By the time that he had touched that wall, I was two inches away from that TV screen and I had tears in my eyes and it was the first time that I really felt that inner drive, that inner desire that I wanted to go to the next Olympics. So I turned to my mum and I said, mum, I want to go to the next Olympics. So what what changed from me just loving swimming to me wanting to go to the next Olympics? It was the belief. I knew Jono. I, I saw how he trained. I knew the system that he'd followed. Uh, we happened to have the same coach. So I thought that if he could do it, so could I. And that was my first step, belief. Now, here's an old photo of my room. And I don't know if you can see that little sign that's in the background to my left, but it was a sign that one of my, uh, my coaches had given me and it said, I'm tired and I'd like to sleep in, but that won't help me. In 1985, going training will help me. And I used to scrub out each year, I'd scrub out 85, make it 86, 87, 88, 89, 90. That sign stayed on my wall until I retired in 1992. So the first step was belief. Do, and, and so I want you to think about what do you really want to achieve? You know, have you thought about that? What really motivates you? So we've all listened to motivational speakers. I'm one myself. And, you know, you get geared up, you get excited um, and you walk away. But that excitement only lasts for four, maybe four days maybe a few bit longer. So the first step is to make a decision. So, you know, what do you really want to do? Where do you want to be? And then, you know, Phil DeBella spoke about in his series with this, um, these workshops, he talked about vision and he talked about goal setting. You know, have you clarified your company or your individual vision? What is it? Have you shared it with people? You know, have you spent time working on your goals? First, you have to be really ready to win, you know, and then you've got to be committed to achieving those results. Once you make that decision, you're so far ahead of where you were the day before. Now, you may find that others challenge you with your dream or with your vision. If they do, I want you to remember something they are probably feeling challenged themselves. And remember, think about what have they achieved. Now, we all come across roadblocks in our mission or our goal uh, to achieve our goals and our dreams. As I mentioned in the resilience workshop is that I had a massive roadblock to achieving my goal of Olympic medal, the East German swimmers. Now you can see from this photo that that girl on the left, she is strong. You know, we knew that they were strong. We knew that they had been taking drugs. For me, it was about how can I get around that roadblock myself and how can I do what it needs to take to be competitive and to achieve my goal? So what are some of the roadblocks that you're experiencing in business? Have you identified them? Let's look at some of them. So the first one is self-limiting beliefs. Now, these are just perceptions that, you're, that, you, that you have about yourself. Mostly, they're untrue. 
Others will be, you know, others see more in us than what we see in ourselves. We have to believe, take on that belief of what others have, you know, in us. Paradigms. What are paradigms? Well, they're just a multitude of habits, like a program that's basically been embedded into your subconscious and um, that control every habitual behavior that we have. Virtually all our behavior is habitual. When we get up in the morning or when we go to bed at night, we follow a particular routine. We don't have to think about it. It just happens. We just do it. So a paradigm is an idea that is fixed in your subconscious that you have, you know, that you act upon without any actions required. However, remember, actions cause results. So the fear of failure. This is a big one. You know, it doesn't matter what industry you're in, doesn't matter what sport you're in. You know, it doesn't matter. Everybody has a fear of failure or a fear of success, right? And it could be that. But behind many of our fears is the worry about doing something wrong or looking silly or foolish and not meeting some kind of expectation. By framing a situation you're dreading differently before you attempt it, it may actually able to take some stress and anxiety away from that. There are also, also different um, definitions of failure and the beauty is that we choose how to look at it you know you've all heard of the fear um, uh, that uh, it's false evidence appearing real we can look at it as the end of the world or we can see it as a learning experience and how can we do it better or differently next time we can easily find many people who experience failure but have had extreme success you know, Michael Jordan, he was cut from the high school basketball team because his coach didn't think he had enough skill. Warren Buffett, you know, one of the richest men in the world um, and the most successful businessman in the world and was rejected by Harvard University. And of course, we all know Richard Branson, who was a high school dropout. So really, there is no failure because no one actually fails. Why? Because everyone actually creates a result. Okay, so think about that. There is no failure because you actually create a result. It just may not be the result you're looking for. So your current life situation or the circumstances that you're experiencing right now are nothing more than the direct result of the thoughts the decisions and the actions that you've taken in the past. The past has nothing to do with, with the future, unless of course you don't learn from it or you don't act differently. Of course, procrastination, everyone in some form has experienced procrastination. What is it? It's the act of delaying or postponing a task or a set of tasks that we wanna achieve. So why do we procrastinate? One explanation is that we value immediate rewards more highly than we do future rewards. If we can see ourselves as our future selves being successful, it's easier for the brain to see the value in taking actions with long-term benefits. So how can we take action? One idea is tempta temptation bundling. Only do things you love, while doing things you procrastinate on. We'll work on some things, right? So for example, exercising while listening to your favorite music or podcast. So you're doing exercise that you may not enjoy, but you're listening to your favorite music or podcast that you do really enjoy. So you're focusing on what is good. For the ladies, getting a pedicure while processing overdue emails. Um, you know, what's your favorite TV show while ironing. And for me, this is the only way to iron, right? So because I'm concentrating on the on the on my favorite show, you know, how many people get distracted by shiny objects? You know, phones, emails, the pings that you hear each day from, you know, it could be anything, ping, ping, ping. You hear it, you know what I'm talking about. Turn those notifications off while you're concentrating on your, your important task for the day. One way is to set daily routines. So at the end of the workday, you can write down five or six things that are the must, most important thing to do tomorrow. No more than six, okay? Then you could prioritize those items in order of true importance. 
And then when you arrive tomorrow, concentrate on only the first task. Work until it's finished, then move on to the next one. Approach the rest of those tasks the same, the same way. And at the end of the day, if you, if you haven't completed them all, put those then into the task for tomorrow. And then just repeat that process um, every working day. And remember, 21 days to create a habit. So why is this effective? Because it's simple and it forces us to make the tough decisions. What's the priority? What's the most important thing I can do for my business today? It removes the uncertainty of where to start and it's just a single task. And the visual evidence, you know, as your progress increases, it's natural that you will feel more motivated because you're achieving things and you're actually gonna feel better about yourself. What about lack of purpose? So how many of us actually know what our purpose is? What is your purpose in your business? What is your purpose in life? A purpose is the reason we exist. So purpose creates meaning. It offers a sense of direction and helps guide our paths, behaviors and goals. It's not always easy for us to find our purpose. Actually, it's actually very difficult. But you, because you may have been told as a child that you have to follow a certain path and you may have been discouraged, you know, following the actual path that you were really passionate about. This happens. And over time, those regular messages of that don't do this, you know, follow someone else's dream limits our own self-belief. Another way our purpose can dim is from being completely wrapped up in the day-to-day -day activities of living and, and find ourselves stuck in a rut. Many people have experienced that. So what does it mean to live with purpose? Your purpose is unique to everybody else. There are also different interpretations. However, everyone tends to agree on three main areas that we connect with and express purpose in our lives. Our career or our work. Social, so aligning our relationships to family, friends and the community with our personal values. Or spiritual, spiritually, seeking meaning and fulfilment through our religious or our spiritual beliefs. Some people align in just one of these areas, whilst others strive to achieve in, in all. Self-belief is a lot easier when you find your or know your why. A key component to self-motivation is knowing your why. Why are you doing it? Simon Sinek created a movement with his book, Start, your, Start With Why. Every leader and company knows the what. They can describe their products, their industry, their competitors. Some companies also know how they do what they do. Their unique differentiators and their values. But few companies know or articulate their why, their purpose, their cause or their belief. The why is the reason for being and the why is what everyone should care about. Most companies will start with what and it's the easiest to articulate. Then they'll discuss the how. But Simon suggests that we start with why and discuss the how and then end with the what. To quote Simon, Com companies communicate from the in outside in, but when we communicate from the inside out, the why is offered as the reason to buy and the what's serve as the tangible proof of that belief. You know, Apple starts with why. And is Apple a computer company? Is it a smartphone company? Or is it an electronics company? These are all expressions of what? But actually started, Apple started in the 2000s with their campaign called Think Different. This was their why communication. They've always been a disruptor of technology. People identify with the why. And it's why they, when they release a new product, their core hard fans will line up sometimes for days and sleep out overnight to be the first ones to obtain it. People identify with thinking different and being an innovator. Starting with why allows your customers to a way to identify with you on a personal level as well. If your why matches their why, they're willing to follow you to the ends of the earth. They'll be a, um, a customer for life. But without a clear why, people default to the what. 
and puts you in a struggle of differentiating yourself with others with your product or your features or your price. People don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. And if you have a clear sense of why, and that is emphasized in your branding and message, people will be able to identify with you a lot more. However, you need to have the why, how, and what in harmony. To build trust with your customers, you need to have um, authenticity. That means that, um, that your how, the actions, and what, the results, have to be consistent with your why, which is your beliefs. They all need to work in harmony. People can see through people that are inauthentic and they lose trust. So in order to create harmony between them, you need clarity of why, discipline of how, and consistency of what. So let's look at clarity of why. Um, Spotify, for example, um, their why is to inspire human creativity by enabling a million artists to live off their art and a billion people to enjoy it and be inspired by it. Um, the company from Italy, La Mazzocco, they make espresso machines for cafes. Their why is to build relationships so, so that we enrich the lives of others. So everyone loves a good cup of coffee, right? And there's thousands of coffee companies out there. And as I'm reading the enrich the lives of others, I'm thinking about the emotional feeling that I feel when I'm sitting down with someone and sharing a good cup of coffee with someone. And what about Southwest Airlines? We connect people to what's important in their lives through friendly air travel. They provide friendly, low cost and reliable air travel connecting people. So let's look at the discipline of how. Once you can articulate the why, you need the discipline to act in ways to support your purpose. This is where the how comes in. The hows are the values and principles that guide your actions and decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. There are differentiators of your product or service. And consistency of what? What you do brings your why to life. A why is your core belief, remember. How are the actions and decisions you take to support the why? The what is everything you produce. You know, we can use the why when in a discussion with a new customer to help them self-select as to whether they believe in our cause. If they do, they'll buy and the, and um, into the why and they would rather, and we do it rather than the what. Sorry, let me do that, say that again. If they do, they will buy into the why. We do it rather than what we do, which can set the stage for them to become loyal customers for life. If our product or service can make a customer's life better, we can use the why to help engage with them uh, and how that can make their life different by using our product or service. Why is emotional. People always buy why you do something, not what you do. So let's look at your purpose. So understanding yourself right? No one knows you better than you do. You know what inspires you and what motivates you. More than likely, this is what you, why you went into business in the first place for yourself. You know, you either felt limited um, by working for somebody else, or you felt that you didn't fit into that box. You had dreams, you had big expectations and aspirations for the future. We use our life experience to make some of those decisions or where we want to go and what we want to do and why. We are the only ones responsible for creating our ideal life. We are in control of our actions, our feelings and emotions. Our desires and dreams is what's going to spur us on no matter what. So core desires. Core desires aren't wishes or insincere goals like New Year's resolutions. You know, we know that they're made to be broken. They're not things that would be nice to have or ought to have, or need to, or shoulds either. They are what get you excited, get you steamed up and desired in the, in, from the heart. You know, you want them with all your heart. They're heart set goals. When you have a core desire driving you, obstacles may get in your way and slow you down, but they won't stop you. When I was younger, remember, I didn't win everything. I 
um, a few years ago, I met up with one of the girls that I used to race against when I was a young, um, you know, at primary school. And she said, Julie, you and I used to battle it out for who would win, you know, the butterfly or the backstroke and the freestyle, you know, and, you know, you'd win one, I'd win one. And she goes, I always wondered that if I had have kept swimming, would I have gone to the Olympics too? I said, well, actually, I train six days a week. I train twice a day. I swam between 80 and 100 kilometers a week. I ran. I ran up, up and down stairs. I, um, you know, I sacrificed friend, time with friends and, and family. I sacrificed outings as a, as a teenager. Um, I said, you were never that committed. And she said, you're right. I probably would never have gone. So everything we need is within us. We just need to tap into how we, what stirs us up. We need to find those 100% desires, not the 50% half-hearted ones. You know, if I would have said, you know, oh, it'd be nice to go to the Olympics, you know, when Jono hit that wall or only turned up to half the sessions that Laurie had for us, I would never have gone. So in my resilience webinar, I spoke of Louis Zamp Zamperini. You know, he was an Olympian in 1936. He was then commissioned to the US Army Air Forces as a Lieutenant. He spent 47 days with two other crew members out floating out to sea. He was captured by the Japanese and sent to two different prisoner of war camps. He was beaten and tortured after refusing to cooperate with the Japanese. His core desire was to make it home. He never gave up. So when we follow our core desires, our why, and strive to achieve all our dreams and goals, we have tremendous success. Never underestimate that desire. So here are some eight steps to self-motivation. Start simply. Keep motivators near your work area. You know, like I did with that sign and the pictures of the, of the swimmers and um, John Seaman. You can have pictures of your family, your dream house or your holiday house. Find what motivates you and what stirs you up, gets you emotional. Keep good company. You know, like I mentioned before, some people are going to knock you for having big dreams. Sometimes that's family. So just limit your time with those that aren't lifting you. Share your goals and dreams and surround yourself with people that uh, have that same drive, that same motivation, and those that believe in you. Keep learning. Continue to, you know, yourself with personal development. It's something I do every day. See the good in the bad. When you encounter obstacles or hurdles, get in the habit of finding what works to get over or around them. Besides positive thinking, we can build our internal motivation when, um, when we build up our mental strength as well. And remember, there is no failure because we always get a result. Stop thinking. You know, we get too stuck in our head, that voice in our head. When we get into our heads too much, we lose sense of the why, why we're doing it. You know, honour yourself and take a break or go out for a walk in nature. Or as I mentioned in a previous webinar, get on YouTube and, and you know, if it's the ocean that inspires you or bushwalks or, you know, watch a YouTube clip of that and tap back into that feeling. Know yourself. There will be times when motivation subsides, of course, and when you feel like a superstar. That's natural. But take note of events or situations that may have pre, um, preluded that and be aware. And once you're aware of them, you know, you can actually work around them to avoid it. Track your progress, whether it's a big project where you're checking in each week or um, it's yearly targets where you're checking in quarterly. Tracking your progress will actually enable you to be able to see if you are ahead or behind the game. Help others. Share your ideas and help friends who are on the similar path to get, you know, to help get them get motivated as well. Because when you see others doing well, you get motivated at the same time. Share your experiences and how you overcame some challenges. Because when you help others stay motivated regularly, you will find the cycle continuing where in, in every facet of staying motivated is refined and developed. So find what um, 
So find what's important to you. Find what works for you. You know, I've given you some tips here today that help to tap you into your why, your core desires to help you wake up each day excited for what you are creating. So we have some fantastic panelists uh, with us today, and they have been with us for the last four weeks. Um, we have Kasia McNaught, who is also passionate about digital marketing and communications. She's got over 14 years experience and for the last five years has run a boutique digital marketing consulting business specializing in social media marketing, content creation and public relations. We also have Tanya Begg today, who has over 20 years experience and her focus has been on business growth through organizational strategy, development, encompassing leadership capability and team development. And we have Dante St. James. Dante's strengths lie in the digital space with a background in digital and traditional media since 1996. He is an accredited Facebook community trainer and holds over 82 digital um, technology certifications a specialist in digital marketing, social media, CRM systems, and SEOs. So welcome, panelists. So we've got um, quite a few questions that have been coming in as you've been speaking, Julie, which is fantastic. Uh, to all of our other attendees, if you do have any questions, for Julie or for any of our panelists, please just pop them into the Q&A and I will ask them for you. Uh, if there's anything that we can't answer, we will take offline and provide you with an answer offline. Um, so our first question we have is um, from one of our attendees. They have asked the need to please or having a pleaser personality can be so demotivating. How do you deal with this? Um, well, for, I am a. I used to be a people pleaser. <laughs> I think there's a lot of people that are people pleasers. And the thing for me, um, what I learned was once I started delving into um, personal development, that really changed a lot for me. Um, I was looking for uh, why I had attracted certain people into my life that weren't always, you know, super... Uh, supportive of me and they certainly weren't very respectful of me and for me that was a massive self-belief and self-worth um, journey for me because I I didn't have a lot of self-worth I um, because I'd had these old beliefs that I wasn't good enough right um, and it's a long story short but I just because I never achieved all the success that I wanted to in my swimming I felt I wasn't good enough and that I'd let the country down so once I started delving into um, my own personal development, I realized that does their opinion matter? And it is a big no. Their opinion does not matter. You are the only person that you have to please. Because if you're looking in the, like one of the exercises I help my clients with is that if you're looking in the mirror at the end of the day or the beginning of the day, as long as you can say you have done everything that day to help you achieve your dreams, because remember I said earlier that it's your dreams, it's not their dreams. If you've done everything, that's the only person you have to satisfy is yourself. And that takes practice, right? Um, and, you know, and so it may take time for you to build up and, and be able to do that easily. But just remember their opinion is their opinion. They're entitled to it. However, you're the only one that you have to please. Thank you, Julie. Would uh, any of our panelists like to add on or add any of their experiences on being people pleasers or how not to be? I'll jump in there because um, just like you, Julie, lived my whole childhood as, a, as such a people pleaser and and I guess I misinterpreted that when I got a lot older I realized that it wasn't so much I was a people pleaser I just was a bit of a show pony I just lived the applause I liked people I liked positive reinforcement I liked people recognizing the good work I was doing so once I recognized and got really honest with who I am myself and got comfortable with it just knowing that it's not a bad thing to be a bit of a show pony you just got to give it some context and, and, and channel it the right way um, then I learned that wait all this people pleasing was just me trying to please myself in the end so when i was able to channel that i was able to go 
Honestly, if I want the applause and I want the attention, do good work, channel it into doing good work rather than just wandering around and going, oh, if I'm nice to someone, then maybe they'll like me and then maybe they'll, they'll want to use me as, as, as a provider. It doesn't work that way. It really doesn't. If you go around constantly trying to please, oh, well, what's the old, um, if you try to please all, you'll please none. And that's the trap for those of us who tend to like a little bit of attention sometimes <laughs> is that we try to please everybody and we end up pleasing absolutely no one and we're not delivering at all. Thank you, Dante. Uh, so we have another question from one of our attendees. How do you stay true to purpose and other motivators when there is so much uncertainty now? Um, and they've used the example of uh, right now being our current COVID reality. Does anyone want to add some insights to that one? I might jump in there for that one. Um, I think because the work I do with ASBAS or my role with ASBAS is all around general business advice and so strategy leadership, team performance. And I've mentioned it a few times through um, this series that we need to have those personal goals um, as well as our business goals. Um, and if people don't have any sort of plan, how can they stick to it? I mean, and yes, COVID has been very uncertain, but for those businesses who have had a plan and stuck to it or, you know, just finessed it as they needed to, to keep going through this period, then they have come out pretty well with this, for, um, whereas others who don't have it, you know, they have probably had some other difficulties, you know, and we're not talking about the certain sectors. And I think that's the same in as a person as well. If we don't have, you know, we're, we're, we've got that vision, we know where we want to be by a certain period, and if we don't just focus on that and keep that as our, you know, our mainstay, then it is really easy to, to lose sight of our purpose and, you know, fall off the wagon a little bit. So we need to keep that vision and focus at the forefront of our mind. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I back Tanya up with that one is that, you know, when just stay clear with what your mission is, what your, you know, what is, what are you trying to achieve, you know? And I think also try and just focus on what you can control. You know, you can control your attitude, you control your feelings and your, and your own motivation, right? So stay away from as much as you can from mainstream media don't feed the fear, just know what's, what you can do, know what's sort of going on a little bit, but don't get absorbed into that because that will just send you down a spiral of negativity and, you know, just focus on what your outcomes need to be. Thank you for that. I think this next question um, is a pretty tricky one. So maybe we'll open it up and get some insights from all of our panelists. Um, why is finding your why, so I guess your mission and vision, so difficult? Does anyone want to volunteer? Yeah, I'll, I'll say it is difficult, right? And I said that. <laughs> but look, it's because a lot of our beliefs we've actually taken on from other people, right? So you think about all the, um, and, and, and it's not because they've been uh, trying to be negative, but it's from what they learned when they were younger. And, you know, and sometimes, you know, when you get told something enough, it becomes a belief. So, you know, I, in my first uh, series, the, the resilience one, I talked about that my dream when I was a kid was to be a jockey, right? So when I got to 10 and people said, what do you want to, what do you want to be when you grow up, Julius? I'm going to be a jockey. You know, of course, they laughed at me and because I was already tall and th my dad said, honey, you're too big to be a jockey. Well, my dreams were shattered, you know, and so then it was just, you know, you. I, I but no one told me I could have been an equestrian Olympian. No one offered that, you know, it was no, 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 you're going to be a swimmer, you know, so who knows where I could have gone if I had have been. Um, you know, an equestrian rider. Who knows? I don't know. Maybe hopeless. Maybe I'll crack my head open or, or fall or something. Who knows? But it's just digging down deep. What's important to you? You know, just sitting with it. You know, there's lots of resources on the internet that you can find to help you. You know, that Simon Sinek's book, read that. Read it twice. Read it three times, you know, to try and find out what your why is. But just sit with it. What are you passionate about? What drives you? 
you know, and then you're going to, those answers will come to you and it may take a little bit of time, but the most important thing is be kind to yourself. Don't force yourself into, I've got, I need it today, you know, or, and even with, when you're doing your goal setting, you know, doesn't have to be done today, but you might write down some notes and as things come up during the week, you might write down some more. And then, you know, when you've got a nice cup of tea on a Sunday morning and, and it's a beautiful day, that might be the environment for you to be able to sit down and go, okay, what are the, out of these, which is the most important for me? And then, you know, being able to develop it from that. Just don't put pressure on yourself, whatever you do. Thank you so much, Julia. That was uh, a really fantastic answer. Um, we've got another question which has come through directed at you specifically. Um, how do elite athletes deal with the spotlight and media attention when they fall short of expectations? So I was pretty lucky that in my career, uh, there was no social media. Um, actually, most of my life, I've agreed that, that, thank goodness, there was no social media. Um, being a bit of a larrikin and uh, lots of practical jokes on people in my swimming team. But I think... Uh, if I look at, you know, the current athletes, you know, um, even, even when I, so when I got to Barcelona, um, I actually had septicemia. I didn't know it at the time. Um, I went in ranked number one in the world. I knew I could win the gold medal. I'd beaten Janet Evans before. Um, I, the East Germans, the Berlin Wall had come down by then. So a lot of their drug taking regime had ended. Um, I knew I could beat them and I didn't make finals. You know, and so here we were, this big, here I was, this spotlight on build up on that, how I was, you know, as another Janet Evans, Julie McDonald, um, head to head battle. Well, I didn't even make the final. So there was a lot of immediate tension on um, the fact that I didn't make it, but also that then my own mindset, right? So my own thoughts of, I've let the country down. I've let myself down. I've let my family down. Everyone that supported me. Uh, two days later, I jumped on a plane and came home to Brisbane. Um, and, and of course, when I arrived, there was newspapers there. The thing is, I tell all athletes, don't read your own press. The, the, the worst thing you can do is read what someone else is writing about you because we all know that media can be manipulated. I've been on the receiving end of that several times. Um, even television interviews where they can cut your words and put it into the way that you want. Don't read your own press, you know, be clear with your message, go into each interview with your own message and, um, and deliver that. Um, don't criticize, condemn or judge others in public um, ever. Actually you should never do it anyway, but right. should never, they should never do that anyway. And then, if they just stay focused on what their goals and dreams are and not worry about all the noise that's in the background, you know, this doesn't matter if you're an elite athlete or anyone, don't, don't listen to what the noise is, you know, just stay focused on what you want to do. Stay in your own lane. Just focus on where you want to go. What do you need to do? What are the steps you need to take? And, you know, and, just stay with that because then you you can't get caught up and, and that little voice in your head doesn't start telling you ridiculous stories. Thank you for that, Julie. Um, so I guess looking at our business uh, professionals that we have on our panel, um, how would you, would you give the same advice to people in business if they are falling short of their client expectations or if something negative happens and perhaps they're getting a bit of negative media attention, how would you suggest they deal with that? Um, I can say something maybe? Oh, sorry. Is, is that for us or for Julie? For you, Kasia, go ahead. Oh, okay. Cause I haven't said anything, but I've been listening. It's been so great that I've just like not even wanted to open my mouth yet, but um, um, so thanks guys. But I get this a lot with clients as well, asking me this question, you know, and um, so while it's great advice on, you know, definitely don't read your negative press. And I totally agree with, you know, how to deal with haters don't because um, they're not ever going to be the type of people you want to work with or deal with. But um, in terms of, you know, like a public review scenario on um, social media or Google, for example, 
what I would say is that it's important to always um, just respond professionally in terms of um, even to a negative review, um, more so than ever, because if um, there's a response there that shows that initiatives being taken and care is there, you know, um, that really is your best PR strategy, in my opinion, you know, don't ignore it, don't, um, you know, write something angry and, you know, we as humans have this psychological thing where we might have, you know, 20,000 great comments and reviews and maybe two bad ones, but for some reason it's like the bad ones that seem to stick, you know, it's, <laughs> it's a thing. So, uh, yeah, just being aware of it, I guess. Thank you, Kasha. That's, yeah, I think Thanks. that's excellent advice. Um, so another question that we've got, um, which came in prior to the session, um, in terms of changing direction. So Julie, you spoke a lot about, um, you know, coming up with your why and un really understanding your vision and your mission and, and really going in, you know, steadfast in that direction. But what happens if you, you start moving in that direction and you realize that it's not for you or it's not working or there's external factors that might be impacting your success there? Um, how do you change direction and then re-motivate yourself to you know, reapply yourself in that new direction? I think it comes down to you know, very simple, keeping it simple, very simple processes of just you know, that um, regular check-in where you're at, you know, are you where you're supposed to be? Um, are you before, behind? Are you ahead? If, for example, you know, last year we saw a lot of people having to change careers and things like that, it is just tuning into yourself and just knowing, having that belief that you can do anything. You know, if you really set your mind to it, we can achieve anything. And, you know, like I had that situation when I gave up swimming, I, you know, was literally begging people for a job because I didn't have any other qualification except a high school certificate. Um, but I knew that I could do anything. And if I was just given the shot and when I, when I got a, my first job, I was just basically thrown in, you know, I had no experience in event management. I was thrown in the deep end and it was just like, I had to figure it out myself. So that, that core belief of, I can do it and, you know, and understanding that you can learn whatever skill you need to, right? There's so many more resources out in the world today than there was, you know, when I first started my career that you can easily tap into and, and find a mentor. You know, I wish that when I was younger that people had said, find a mentor. And in, it doesn't matter what career you're in or what um, industry, because there's people out there that will offer their services and would love to mentor people and take people under their wing. Thank you. Do any of our panelists, would you like to add anything to that? I'm sure you've experienced quite a lot of client stories that are similar this year, people pivoting and changing direction. How have you been helping them manage that? I'll pop in there. Um, I guess um, a lot. Of, I work with a lot of um, hospitality, tourism, and particularly tourism-related clients. So, as you can imagine, it's been a really interesting past twelve months for them. And in almost every case, they've been able to pivot because they didn't have their heart set on one particular outcome. Their outcome was to provide a way that I don't have to have a job, so that I can, um, you know, feed my family and have the lifestyle I want to have without having been employed. Now, they might have done that by having a tour bus business or they might have done that by having a walking tour business. But when they realized that the international tourists weren't coming in and there were some disruptions to domestic tourists, they went, okay, well, I, the, the goal is still the same. Feed my family, uh, keep myself going and don't have to go and get a job because I don't react very well to bosses. So they just went, well, what can I now do that will affect that? So is it importing hand sanitizer? Is it switching my distillery into a hand sanitizer business? Is it taking my walking tours into taking walking tours with students through museums? So being able to pivot like that is because they weren't fixated on one particular thing. It's like, yes, I do fishing charters and that's all I do. Well, have you ever thought about doing cruises and doing picnics out on the bay? No, I didn't think of that, but that would be kind of cool for locals. So the ability to go, here's the equipment I've got, here's the experience I've got, Here's what I'm doing, but I can do other things with that equipment and that experience that don't require me to necessarily do that thing that's affected by COVID-19. Thanks, Dante. 
So we've got um, just a reminder to all of our attendees, if you do have any questions, feel free to pop them in the Q&A. We've probably got time for a couple more. Um, but for this one, I think let's go around the table and we'll get um, a bit of a, I guess, a top tip from all of our panellists. Um, so during periods of stress um, or, you know, significant periods of really hard work where you're just emotionally and, and maybe um, physically and mentally drained, is there anything extra that you do uh, to help you stay motivated? The uh, One of the things I use as an analogy for a lot of my clients is that if you think about this as your um, energy levels and your self-worth, if you're operating at 25% or 50%, you can only give 25 or 50% to your clients. So the most important thing is for you to fill yourself up first, emotionally, physically, mentally, everything, so that then you can give more. So how do you fill yourself up? Is it go, you know, get up 15 minutes earlier, watch the sunrise, you know, um, you know, watch the sunrise or, or, you know, close your eyes, allow the sunlight to affect, to hit your face. You know, that not only energizes you, but so super good for you and get your vitamin D. Is it walk around on the grass with in bare feet for 20 minutes? Or, you know, is it listening to a meditation? Is it listening to your favorite music? Whatever it is that fills you up, that makes you feel great, do that regularly because you're the most important thing in your business. You're the most important value to yourself and your family that if you're not looking after yourself, no one else will. Thanks, Julie. What about you, Kasha? Um, yeah, so one thing for me that's super helpful, I find, and I practice it every day as much as I can, mindfulness in terms of um, even just 10 minutes a day. I use an app called Waking Up, which is by Sam Harris, who's a neuroscientist. And um, it's just really just bringing you back into your body and um, awareness. And it's something that you sort of keep doing and then it's translates into everyday moments and my other thing which I'm due for this weekend is you know getting into nature hiking and sunshine fresh air um disconnecting to be honest from you know these things um <laughs> as much as it's where we work and live so yeah I think um micro breaks and disconnecting so you can actually be present with people and yourself and nature simplifying things really I could go on and on and should listen to my own advice and I will this weekend because I'm <laughs> feeling like I need to but yeah it's great you just have to keep reminding yourself and each other I think you know excellent thanks Kasha uh, Tanya yes yeah, similarly um uh similar things to what Kasha said but also I had a real epiphany a few weeks ago um just for me, the regular exercise and like I go to a studio three or four times a week, I'm with the same people. So there's also that connection that's part of it. And because we all know each other and we're, you know, we support each other through difficult times, but it also lifts, lifts you. The chemicals that you get, you know, um, interacting with other people. By the same token, um, making sure, like Julie did mention earlier, that the people that are in your network, uh, are people who support you and encourage you. I think that's also important. Um, the other thing, and if you can hear snoring in the background, that's my fur baby. And I mean, I think we have two of them and they're the most important things in our lives. You know, you just have to hug them and you feel a lot better. Um, but they're just a few of the things, but also that really knowing who you are and it's surprising how many people actually don't. Um, so that personal reflection and journaling, things like that, I think they're really important as well to, to look after yourself. Thanks, Tanya. I wish we could see those fair babies, but that'll be another time. Uh, Dante. Um, I'm a bit of a workaholic because I've chosen work that I really love to do. And so the temptation, to, the minute that I wake up in the morning to reach over and grab the phone and look at what happened overnight is really, really strong. And it's not always work things, it's news, it's messages from mum because mum does this wake up in the middle of the night and message her son thing. And it's just this stuff that, that, that basically from the moment I wake up, I'm in everybody else's world. So my coach, because I've got one and I think they're really valuable to have, has actually said to me, okay, what I need you to do 
is buy a clock radio. Get rid of the phone out of the room so that you don't do that first thing of reach over to the phone and read what's happened the night before and what COVID's doing and, and whether that ship got wedged out of the, the Suez Canal and all those very important things I know that I need to know to get on with my day. And now the first half hour of the day is dedicated to me. So I'm not allowed to do anything for clients, anything for anyone, nothing for mum, just everything for me in that first half hour, whether that's going and cooking myself some breakfast, going for a walk around the block, or just going on the balcony with a coffee and just enjoying the sunrise. But that first half hour of the day when I dedicate it to myself allows me to have so much more energy. So I fill my cup in the morning so that as the day goes along and I'm taking little sips out of it by giving you know, um, so much to other people, that I get to the end of the day, yes, I've got an empty cup, but I'm looking forward to filling that cup again the next morning. That's brilliant advice. Thank you, Dante. And I think today that is all we have time for. So um, firstly, thank you all for having me as your, your guest host for the day. Thank you for all of our panelists, Tanya, Kasha and Dante. Um, and of course, thank you so much, Julie, for giving us your time and uh, all of your valuable insights. So as a reminder, uh, Business Station have brought you this session as part of the Australian Small Business Advisory Services Program which is funded by the Commonwealth Department of Oz Industry. If you'd like to learn more, you can pop on our website. Um, there's an ASBAS program page, which has got all of the information that you need uh, and links to book in with any of our wonderful advisors. Um, you can definitely book in with uh, all three of our panelists who have joined us today if you'd like to learn more um, or work with them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so thank you all very much. Enjoy the rest of your day and have a very happy and safe Easter. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much.